Let's pray together. Oh God, what a reflection, what a thought to go categorically from enemy to friend. To remember what it, what it was to be in hostility against you. Your wrath abiding on us and our fist thrown in the air against you. In whatever form that took to be leveled by grace, to be brought to utter humiliation of a right view of ourselves and to look up and find a father, one who would call us friends, inheritors of infinite riches, citizens of heaven, belonging to you. What privilege, what high infinite privilege to go from where we were to where we are as believers in your Son. Lord, we ask even now again tonight to be humbled all over again, to be leveled by your mercy. We know that you oppose the proud and give grace to the humble. May this passage of your word do just that in us tonight. Bring us low again before you that we might look up and find your favor. That we ask by the power of your spirit that we would be soft-hearted and ears open and ready for all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we are all Nebuchadnezzars at heart, but for the grace of God, we would no doubt easily succumb naturally to his folly. None of us, perhaps with the intellectual capacity, the leadership gifts, the military genius, the management capabilities of a Nebuchadnezzar. But we would surely all take glory for ourselves, taunting heaven with our audacious pride, stealing credit for our successes, despising those beneath us and eliminating those who oppose us. If only we had the position, the resources, the opportunity to make our world the way we want it, to be king. Our natural, selfish, godless bent would lead us to build murder furnaces and to stand on rooftops proclaiming, I did it my way. And I think we're prone to do this in the little realms we occupy to whatever degree our circumstances allow. I'm not a big fiction reader, but two fiction novels from the beginning of the 20th century make it into my favorite books list. They are William Golding's Lord of the Flies and Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. They are really both the same book. They were written in a period of radical optimism about the human condition. Pre-World War I, pre-World War II, pre-horrors of the 20th century, humanity believed it had emerged in evolutionary development into the light of the glory of the best of human civilization. From a European perspective, man had arrived. The Industrial Revolution, medical technology, polite civil society, never mind what Europe was doing in other places. And the story of both of those novels, Lord of the Flies and Heart of Darkness, was that such optimism was ill-founded. That man at his core was not the light of civilization taking the glories of European hierarchy to the dark and savage places in the corners of the earth. In fact, if you were to remove the societal constraints, the societal constraints that, that made an English schoolboy an upright citizen, you take those away and put him on, on a desert island, what does he do? Murder his friends for a seashell. You take away the white sepulchred city of London, as Joseph Conrad calls it, and the best of English society, the most noble, the most intelligent, the most forward thinking, the best England had to offer, would ravage the people of the Congo to get what he wanted. Both of these stories removed the very thin veneer of man as civilized, going out to bring the light of the world to the brutes. The end result was the so-called civilized man ended up exterminating the brutes. Take away the outward form, the, the white paint 
off the sepulcher, off the grave. And you just have the corruption of humanity. What would you be like if you had Nebuchadnezzar's gifts, Nebuchadnezzar's opportunities, Nebuchadnezzar's absolute power? We've heard it said that absolute power corrupts absolutely. If given over fully to yourself with all the world's resources to do what you wanted to do, what would you be like? We'll find out that Nebuchadnezzar's power is not actually absolute. His power is limited in scope and duration, and it is borrowed, and it is accountable. Well, let's take a look together at Nebuchadnezzar's second dream as we find it in Daniel chapter 4. We read the setup last week. We'll pick up in verse 10, and we'll read through verse 27. Follow along with me as I read Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. And I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts of the field flee from under it and the birds from its branches, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground with a band of iron and bronze around it and the new grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it on whom he wishes, and he sets over it the lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation, inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while, as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, My lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelled and whose branches of the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it and the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord, the king, that you be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you, until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestows it on whoever he wishes. And then that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Your kingdom will be assured to you, after you recognize that it is heaven that rules." Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. This passage very clearly proves to Nebuchadnezzar that heaven rules. 
God is proving to Nebuchadnezzar that God is sovereign, not Nebuchadnezzar. And tonight we'll look at that in two scenes. The king relates his dream, and then God interprets his dream through the prophet. There really are three scenes proving to Nebuchadnezzar that heaven rules. Nebuchadnezzar relating his dream, Daniel interpreting the dream, and then God bringing the dream to pass. We'll look at that one next time we're together a week from tonight. God will make Nebuchadnezzar's nightmare a reality. But let's look at the first scene. Nebuchadnezzar relates the dream, beginning in verse 10. And we see, first of all, in this dream, a magnificent tree. A magnificent tree, beginning in verse 10. We read, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong. Its height reached to the sky. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. There is here a magnificent tree, and it is said to be in the midst of the earth. That is, it has some importance. It is central. It is prominent in the earth. And this tree is said to grow great and to grow strong. That is, there is marked increase of the tree in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's not just a big tree that just appeared there, but it started small and became big. This is an indication that Uh, What this tree emblemizes is a continued scalability. It could grow and grow and grow. Its height is reaching to the heavens, and the form of the verb here is this idea of it is reaching. It's not at heaven, but it's approaching the heavens, and its visibility approaching to the end of the earth. This is a vast tree, visible from just about everywhere. In verse 12, we find that its foliage was beautiful. That is, it was healthy, verdant. If you were to say to a tree, what beautiful leaves. Yeah, all trees have leaves. No, your leaves are green. Yes, most leaves of trees are green until the fall or unless you live in Arizona and forget to water. To notice it this way would be an unusual degree of life and health in a tree. This is a prospering tree. Its fruit is abundant, food to all. This is the rising tide able to float all boats. This is a towering tree able to provide for everyone. The beasts of the field would take shade under it, protection from the scorching heat. The birds of the heavens would dwell in it. That is, it was home for many and food for all. All flesh will feed themselves from it. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was of a massive, magnificent tree. We see next in the dream, beginning in verse 13, a message from heaven. Heaven had seen everything Nebuchadnezzar had made of his life and his empire, and heaven was not impressed. Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 13, I was looking in the visions of my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. It begins with, lo, behold, look, there is a surprise here. And Nebuchadnezzar sees a watcher. Uh, Angelic is in italics. Uh, That is supplying the idea of an angelic being here. But literally, the Aramaic just simply says, a watching one, a wakeful one, and holy One singular being with verbs in the singular who is described as both vigilant, never sleeping, always awake, and holy. And from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective here, holy is not some sort of moral purity, but spiritual, supernatural, transcending the world of men. Nebuchadnezzar knows that whoever this is, this is a vigilant one who is not from around here. I do believe it's appropriate to think of this being as an angel. This would be the only place in Scripture that an angel is described this way, but it is fitting. Angels are, of course, messengers of God. They are holy. They are always at the behest of God. They are ministering spirits. They are often sent to convey messages and to announce judgment. And notice this being, this holy watcher, descends from the heavens. This is a message from heaven. And the being 
calls out, verse 14, the New American Standard says he shouted out, that is, he is calling out with strength, literally. And what is called out here? A series of five commands. And all of these commands are plural, so there is one angelic being calling this out loudly, and he is calling to a host of angelic beings, ostensibly, to do these things. What are the commands? Cut down the tree, chop off its branches, make its foliage stripped off, scatter its fruit, and then finally, leave it at the stump. Those are the five commands here, and, and, and these commands are sudden and catastrophic for this massive, magnificent tree. Chop off its branches is in the form of a verb that is violent and intense. Scatter its fruit, likewise, is a, a violent action. You think about the football player who makes a really good tackle, and, and he's got the running back by the foot, and then he just takes off his shoe, and then he throws it. That's a 15-yard penalty on sportsmanlike conduct. You get the idea here that we're not just going to lop off the tree and let everything just fall to the ground, but then we're going to take its life-giving fruit and throw it to the ends of the earth so that it rots in unusability. This is absolute demolition of a tree. Notice what else is scattered besides the fruit. The beasts scatter and the birds scatter. The beasts no longer have shade and protection from the scorching sun, and the birds are now homeless, and they have no food. This fifth command, leave the stump of its roots, begins with a contrast. You see that in the English, yet. It is this nevertheless, it's a strong contrast, and something is to be done with this tree that is different than what's been done before. Demolition is in the first four verses, but in the first four commands. But the fifth command is leave the stump of its roots. And leave it in, in three manners. Leave it in the earth, leave it enclosed by a bronze and iron band, and leave it in the grass of the field by itself. If this tree is not uprooted. It's not a rotting stump in a forest of other trees. It is a protected, isolated stump in an open field. And the message from heaven continues in his dream. But in the middle of verse 15, this tree starts to look like a man. Notice in verse 15, what we've been saying, it, it, it. And then in the middle of verse 15, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. That accurately reflects what's going on here in this text. Now we are looking at a man. And he is drenched with the dew of heaven. That is, he's outside all night and he's wet because the condensation has collected on him. Let him share, or literally his portion will be with the beasts in the grass of the field. Where is he going to get his food? Where is he going to live? What's his new home? In the field. Verse 16, his heart will be changed to that of the beast. His heart, that is his mind, the seat of his reasoning, his thinking will become bovine. And then the text tells us that seven times or seven periods of time will pass over him. Notice in verse 17, this decision is a command of the holy ones. This is by word of the watchers. This comes from those sent by God. This is heaven's message to Nebuchadnezzar about a tree who becomes a man, who becomes a beast. And notice the purpose of the events of this dream, verse 17, in order that Nebuchadnezzar might know. It's not what it says. We find ourselves in this text. Look, look at verse 17 right in the middle. In order that the living may know. May know what? Uh, three things here. The most high is ruler. The most high is the ruling one over the realm, over the dominion, literally over the kingdom of mankind. Not the petty temporary kinglets who parade around. God is in charge. His sovereignty is universal and unlimited. He, in fact, is over every human ruler. 
And the living must know, secondly, that God is the one who gives earth's dominion to whomever he pleases. There's not a single authority, Romans 13, that is not in place except by the hand of God. His placing them, his sovereignty over their rulership is not an endorsement of their lives. It's not an endorsement of their ethics. God is not applauding all that they do, but their placement as rulers on the earth suits God's purposes. He's sovereign. And thirdly, the living must know that God causes the lowliest to be set in positions of rule. This statement is designed to level Nebuchadnezzar. Who gets to be in charge? The lowliest, whomever God pleases. It is true that in the end of things, God will exalt the humble and he will lay low the proud. But I think what's indicated here is that God can make anyone a king, even the inept, incompetent, and foolhardy. Nebuchadnezzar should not think more highly of himself than that God can accomplish his purposes with any old tool he picks up. I think it's fascinating that the angelic watchers here say the purpose of the content of this dream is so that the living may know these three things. Why is it said that way? Well, the dead do know. Those who have left this life have already met their maker and they know. Who resists this knowledge? The living those still on the earth. All errant theology gets corrected on the other side. Outside of a grace relationship to your maker, the other side is too late. So take these things to heart now, you living. Hebrews 9, 27 is appointed for men to die once and then to face judgment. So get your theology straight here. (laughs) Yield to the sovereign God of the universe while you are the living We come to verse 18 and a third portion of this first half of this text, the appeal to the prophet. Notice Nebuchadnezzar, after having experienced this dream, he has gone to Daniel and he says, verse 18, this is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation, inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, this is what I saw, now you tell me what it means, and nobody else could. By the way, God is writing this script in part to shame all false religion and human wisdom. That comes up again and again. And he turns to Daniel and says, but you, Daniel, can interpret this dream because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And remember that Nebuchadnezzar is accurately recounting the story, and at this point in his life, at this point in the narrative, he is not humbled all the way. He is not humbled all the way that he will be later. He is still something of a Yahweh-respecting Babylonian polytheistic idolater. So for him to recognize something transcendent in Daniel or something even special about Daniel's God is not full surrender in faith. He has not yet come to the end of himself. That leads us to the second half here. Daniel interprets the dream. Daniel interprets the dream beginning in verse 19. And it begins in verse 19 with the hesitation by the prophet. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. He was appalled. And it's not clear what the word here means for a while. It could be a moment, it could be an hour, it's used both of those ways in literature. There is a significant amount of time where Daniel just pauses. And why is he pausing? He is appalled, literally appalled in himself. His thoughts have alarmed him. It's not because he's confused about the dream or its meaning. It's not that he cannot conjure up some interpretation on the spot. It's not like he's listening at this moment. He already knows the interpretation of the dream. God has already revealed this to him, and it is troubling to him. Daniel knows that this dream does not bode well for Nebuchadnezzar. And it seems that Daniel is genuinely concerned for his king. Notice how Nebuchadnezzar relates to Daniel. 
He says, don't be alarmed. This is interesting. Nebuchadnezzar is reaching out to Daniel, assuring him that he's not going to a fiery furnace for telling the truth here. There seems to be a significant mutual respect. Nebuchadnezzar for a faithful servant who courageously spoke truth, who worshiped the one true God and served the empire faithfully. And Daniel seems to have held some respect for a king who was by all accounts gifted and conscientious. And I don't mean by that that he was godly or moral, but he apparently had a work ethic, was an effective leader, a competent manager, he got things done, he built a strong and stable empire that covered more territory and more varieties of people, geography and cultures than any before it in human history. And Nebuchadnezzar's reign was a benefit to the Jews in exile. It was a benefit to God's people, Israel. Remember, Israel was to be restored to the land. They were to go back from Babylonian captivity after 70 years. Jeremiah's instruction to the captives was, live in the land, build homes, build families, pray for the welfare of Babylon. A return is coming. And Nebuchadnezzar's reign has actually been a benefit to the people of God. And at this point, Daniel has likely been in Nebuchadnezzar's service for 30 years. He's been around him. He's seen him in action. There has been some level of mutual respect. And so Daniel says, after the the king says, just tell me, don't let it alarm you. Daniel says, my Lord, if only the dream applied to those who were hating you and its interpretation applied to your enemies, your adversaries. Daniel is not cowering in fear here. He's not afraid to tell Nebuchadnezzar the truth. He just is wary about what the truth means for Nebuchadnezzar. I think we'll see this filled out later as Nebuchadnezzar adds to this concern by his exhortation down in verse 27. But I think Daniel here is filled with empathy, compassion. He does not wish ill for Nebuchadnezzar. We see next the description of the tree, verses 20 and 21. This is the same as above. It confirms what Nebuchadnezzar saw. In verse 20, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, was its height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. This, this confirms for Nebuchadnezzar that he and Daniel had seen the same thing. This is going to reinforce the interpretation that comes. Then look at verse 22. We have the identification of the tree, which is really the identification of the man. It is you, O king. Now, this sounds a lot like Nathan the prophet saying to David, You are the man. And here, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the tree. (laughs) Because you, Nebuchadnezzar, you grew great and you grew strong. Your greatness grew great. Your greatness reached to the heavens. Remember in chapter 2, in the first dream, Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. As the head and the emblem and the representation of the entire Babylonian empire and all of its might and all of its glory, he truly was the man that made Babylon great again. Babylon had been a country. It had been a power centuries before. His father conquered some territories and handed it to him, but it was truly Nebuchadnezzar that built it and made it glorious. We'll find out a little bit more about that next week. He says, your dominion has reached to the ends of the earth. And this fits what we talked about last week. The Babylonian Assyrian ascriptions from the time demonstrate that those rulers believed that they ruled the whole earth. They believed that they ruled the whole earth because everywhere they went, their armies conquered. There was nobody who didn't bow the knee to them. There was no one who could resist them. And so they assumed that wherever they would go, they would rule. So they just claimed ownership. This fits the way they saw themselves as ruling the world. We see next the demolition of the tree or demolition of the man. 
in verse 23. And that you saw a watcher or a holy one who said, cut down the tree and demolish it. Uh, destroy here in the English text is not the best word, as if uh, destruction would mean that it, the tree would cease to exist or the tree would die. Uh, this is demolition. This is demo day. Uh, this is a refitting. Daniel here doesn't go into all the details of the demolition. It's probably just enough that Daniel says, cut down the tree and demolish it. But you remember the dream itself was more explicit. Tear off its branches, strip its foliage, scatter its fruit, and its inhabitants will be scattered. When applied to the man Nebuchadnezzar, this is more personal than just a vision of a tree. More painful, no doubt, for Daniel to tell. He simply summarizes it by saying it is demolished. And it is demolished down to the stump in an open field with an iron and bronze band around the stump. That is, this tree's not going anywhere. The greatness is gone. The beauty is gone. Provision for the earth is gone. That's you, Nebuchadnezzar. He goes on to tell him that he will be drenched with the dew of heaven, verse 23, and share with the beasts of the field until seven periods, seven times pass over him. There is in verse 24 a reiteration of authority. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the king. And notice the angelic watchers described this as the decree and interpretation of the holy ones, of the watchful ones. And here Daniel makes it clear that they are messengers. They are messengers of the Most High. They are messengers of the Most High God, the God of Israel. This is His word. This is His authority. And this decree, this interpretation concerns you. Nebuchadnezzar, God has a personal message for you and your life. I almost want Daniel at this point to say something like, kind of tongue-in-cheek, and what God is there, O Nebuchadnezzar, who could deliver you out of Yahweh's hand? He doesn't do that. But the point of this ought to be very clear. God is sovereign. God is in charge. And none can thwart his hand or question his doings. We get the interpretation of the dream in verses 25 and 26. That you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize it is heaven that rules." And notice the explanation, the, the interpretation. It, it really only covers the second half of the dream. There was no need for Daniel to add color to the first half. Nebuchadnezzar was already convinced of his own greatness. That part of the identification was not a challenge. In fact, it's probably the reason Nebuchadnezzar was so disturbed. He probably assumed he was the tree in the dream. What disturbed him was the demolition of the tree and the subsequent events. Daniel fills that in here in verses 25 and 26. He says that you be driven away from mankind. Why would Nebuchadnezzar the king, and under what authority would Nebuchadnezzar be driven away from his people, from his palace, from his home, from his empire, from all of his servants who catered to his every whim? I think we have the clue up above in the dream that his mind was turned to the thinking of a cow. And which came first is not clearly stated. Is it that Nebuchadnezzar went crazy and people said, we've got to institutionalize this guy. We've got to put him away. Did somebody invoke the 25th Amendment? He's no longer able to function. Send him out to pasture. His mind was altered, and he went out to the field. 
He was to dwell with the wild beasts, with the beasts of the field, the the large grazing herbivores. He was to not just live where they lived, but to live how they lived, and he was to eat like they ate. I don't know if in your home people eat strange things, especially the little people in your home. Pick up things and put them in their mouths. Michael Lotito a uh, Frenchman um, who got nicknamed Monsieur mange which means Mr. Eat Everything. Over the course of his life of entertainment, ate 18 bicycles, seven TVs, two beds, 15 supermarket trolleys, a computer and a coffin handles and all, a pair of skis and six chandeliers. He did this by taking things apart and making them down into their smallest pieces and loosening things up with mineral oil. Between 1978 and 1980, he coaxed down an entire Cessna, piece by piece. That's strange. I've been waiting for a place to use that illustration for years. There are clinical derangements that have been cataloged of human beings believing they are animals. Lycanthropy is the, originally means um, a wolf man, and it's the clinical assessment of people who think that they are wild dogs or wolves. Boanthropy is the clinical attachment to the feeling that you are a cow. Uh, and there are people documented who have believed they are all sorts of animals. Old Testament scholar R.K. Harrison in the early 20th century firsthand witnessed a case of boanthropy. A man who believed he was a cow was institutionalized and didn't like to sleep indoors. He was found roaming about outside all the time and he ate grass. Uh, this is not proof of the truth of Daniel 4. Uh, it does illustrate, though, that Nebuchadnezzar was crazy. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar would be fed greens like cattle. By the way, the, the word for what Nebuchadnezzar would eat here is different than the green grass word um, earlier in the passage. It does have a broader context of herbs. So it's possible he ate cilantro and, and not just the, the um, field clippings. But this would be an utter humiliation to graze around like a cow to have your lot and your portion and your meals with the cattle, to be wet from the dew of heaven, to be left out of doors for seven periods. Nebuchadnezzar was isolated, crazy, grazing like a cow, thinking like a cow, exposed to the elements for a long time. The seven times here, or the seven periods of time, is is most likely years. Uh, For a couple of reasons, Um, seven hours wouldn't make much sense of the passage, seven days either, seven months doesn't fit the narrative. It's hard to go longer than years, seven decades would be problematic. And in chapter seven, the same word for times, we'll see when we get there, indicates years. I think it's appropriate to see Nebuchadnezzar's mental faculties deprecated here for seven years. And after this seven years, notice until, Daniel says, until you know something. What is Nebuchadnezzar supposed to know? That the Most High is ruling over the kingdoms of mankind. Dominion is truly his. He is sovereign. This is the theme of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, until you understand your place, you have had a high assessment of yourself and therefore a low view of God. That's going to be reversed. It is the Most High who gives dominions to whomever He pleases. And look at the mercy of God on display in verse 26. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Listen, from the start, Nebuchadnezzar never deserved a kingdom. He never deserved another breath of God's air on the earth. 
And yet God's mercy here is remarkable. God commanded a band around the stump, a strong band, iron and bronze. And at one level, it meant that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't going anywhere. But it also means in his isolated, exposed insanity, he would be protected by the Most High God. Perhaps even guarded by those assigned to protect him as he grazed in the open fields. And look at what verse 26 promises. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. That is, Nebuchadnezzar would be protected from harassment. In this provision of mercy, there would be a hope of restoration. I had two trees go down in successive years from the remnants of Mexican hurricanes that made their way into the valley with 40 mile an hour plus winds. The Palo Verde tree in my front yard that put out those bright yellow flowers every Easter that shaded our front room from the sun and then the leaves closed up in the winter and allowed allowed warm sun to come through the window and keep us warm. It was the perfect tree and the perfect placement. That one went down. And then my Chinese elm went down. Both of those trees were a significant loss of shade and delight in our front yard. Now, the Palo Verde tree, I put a chain under the root ball and attached the chain to my Suburban. Now, that is a recipe for a YouTube video. You know, when the root ball springs out and goes through the back window of the Suburban, you've seen those videos. I almost created one of those. But the, Palo, or, but the Chinese elm, I, I love those trees. I wanted that one to come back. I I cut it down to the stump and I left it in the ground. I made sure it still got water. Uh, I didn't cut it up. I didn't put things inside it to make the the stump rot away. I wanted a tree there again. As of this afternoon, my Chinese elm growing out of that stump is now 12 feet tall. There is such a grace here from God and Nebuchadnezzar. He, He should have been, could have been, ripped out by the roots, destroyed, done away with forever at this point. Instead, God's plan is to humble him and restore him. That leads Daniel in verse 27 to an exhortation. The last thing we'll see in this verse is the exhortation by the prophet. Therefore, O king, Daniel says, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Daniel here breaks off from interpretation and starts preaching. There is exhortation here, instruction, pleading. And I think we see in this Daniel's personal compassion for Nebuchadnezzar. Listen, the appropriate inference from this dream and its interpretation is pretty simple in Daniel's mind, and he delivers it courageously to Nebuchadnezzar. Repent. Repent. And this is potentially costly to speak more than what the king requested. The king demanded that Daniel give him the interpretation. And Daniel gives him the interpretation and then dares to speak boldly beyond what the king asked, even encroaching on telling, what, telling the king what to do to reprimand the king. This was risky. It required courage and conviction and compassion. You know, the kind of courage and conviction and compassion goes with evangelism, but where we are confident about the truth And the truth liberates us from fear in some sense because we know our Savior, we know what He's done for us, and we know He is ready to forgive sins to anyone who would believe. But to get that message across requires the abject humiliation of the sinner, coming to grips with the reality that I am at enmity with God and that I am the problem, and someone has to have the boldness to tell me. The courage and the conviction The compassion, all on display here in Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar. Notice what he says, may my advice be pleasing to you. Such a fascinating word. Look back at verse 2 of chapter 4. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar made this proclamation. This is the conclusion before he tells the story of how he got to the conclusion. And he's gathering all nations to listen. (laughs) And he says in verse 2, it is seemly to me to declare... 
It seemed good to me. It captures the idea of that which is pleasing and that which is obligated. It is the right thing to do for Nebuchadnezzar to declare to the nations that heaven rules. And he'll do that after he's humiliated. But it also made Nebuchadnezzar happy to do it. That exact same word is here for Daniel. May my advice be pleasing to you. That is, let it be a pleasing obligation. Nebuchadnezzar, listen to me. What I'm about to tell you is the right thing to do. Want to do it. (laughs) This should be pleasing. And then he says, now, break away from your sins. Tear them away from you. That's the same word used in Exodus 32. Tear out the gold earrings. How? By righteousness. And he says, and break away from your iniquities. How? By showing mercy to the poor. This is fascinating. Daniel's instruction to Nebuchadnezzar is so instructive here. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of a world-dominating empire. Nobody told him what to do. Nebuchadnezzar's word was the law. In fact, whatever Nebuchadnezzar did by definition, was good in his empire. Whatever Nebuchadnezzar did was right in his empire because he was the emperor. He was the king of Babylon. He was the definition of right. Everyone who opposed him was, by definition, in the wrong, and they suffered the consequences for it. He was the head. He was the king. He was the tyrant. He was the moral authority in Babylon. He, in fact, taunted the gods. What God is there who could deliver you from my hand? He said to the three Jews thrown into the fire. He claimed for himself ultimate authority. Not just power in the realm, but moral authority. And by claiming ultimate authority, he set himself up as the definition of right. None could cross him without consequence. For Daniel, the slave, to stand before him and say, Break away from your sins. Sins had to be a foreign word to Nebuchadnezzar. And I don't mean that he didn't have right and wrong categories written on his heart. God has placed those in the conscience of every human. But Nebuchadnezzar had written right and wrong in the terms of what he wanted. Does Nebuchadnezzar even have a category for what would be morally right? What moral authority must I submit to that's above me? And Daniel fleshes it out for him. This is part of his divine appointment with humiliation. Nebuchadnezzar must be brought low, not just to live like a cow in the field, but to be shown that he is not the moral authority. Nebuchadnezzar will learn that he is, in fact, not the sovereign definition of right and good. He will be forced to acknowledge an authority higher than himself. The fulfillment of this dream will prove to Nebuchadnezzar, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there is a power greater than Nebuchadnezzar. And that there is a power greater than Nebuchadnezzar means there is a moral obligation higher than himself. Nebuchadnezzar, therefore, is accountable. There is an expectation for his life and his rule, and there is judgment coming. So Daniel says, tear away your sins. Break away from your iniquities by doing right, by showing mercy to the poor. What does Daniel have in mind here? It is well known that the builders in the ancient world, those kings who wanted monuments to their own glory, built them at the cost of laborers. It's one thing for a construction worker to have an accident. It's another one for a tyrant to say, I will build these pyramids and kill all my laborers to do it. That was the attitude of the pharaohs. It is the documented way of the Assyrians and the Babylonians as well. That lives were expendable. The the hoi polloi, the the little people, the the poor. It's okay if my temples and my palaces and my monuments to my own glory are built with the blood of the laborers that I'll sacrifice for it. That's okay because I'm king and that's the way things are. Nebuchadnezzar's attitude for Building projects was you got to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. And then who gets credit for the building? All the laborers? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar stands on the rooftop and says, I did this myself. 
staggering arrogance. So repentance looks like stop seeing people under you as a commodity. Help them. Show mercy. Have compassion towards them. Serve them. Nebuchadnezzar, you have lived as if the world exists for you. This would require, of course, a fundamental alteration in thinking through and through, in believing and acting. Nebuchadnezzar would have to believe that there is a a power, in fact, a moral authority that transcends him, an authority that he is accountable to and will be assessed by. And notice how Daniel closes this exhortation. In case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity... Daniel here is holding out hope that Nebuchadnezzar could change and that there might be a stay of judgment. Yielding in faith, yielding in faith manifested in repentance has stayed God's promised judgment many times. At times, even when the repentance was not lasting repentance, King Ahab comes to mind. He was not repentant from the heart, but he was really sad that God was going to end his line and shorten his reign. And he lowered himself before the Lord. 1 Kings 21, 29, Elijah promised that the end wouldn't come in his lifetime. And you think about Josiah's godly rule in Judah, 2 Kings 22, forestalled the judgment of Judah that was inevitable. God prolonged. Listen to Jeremiah 18. God says to the prophet Jeremiah, at one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. God mercifully at times forestalls deserved judgment. What will Nebuchadnezzar do with this warning? We'll find out next week. Or you could read ahead, or you already know. God mercifully at times forestalls judgment. What would we be like if left to ourselves, if given great power, if given the resources to do what we wanted, if what we wanted at the snap of our fingers just came to be? What would we do with that kind of opportunity? We only need to look at how we operate in little things. Do we happily subject ourselves to the sovereignty of God, yielded in faith to his directives, trusting him with the results? Or do we at times seek to build our own little empires on the backs of others, seeking glory for our accomplishments? We know that God is opposed to the proud and he gives grace to the humble. We ought to learn from this warning passage to Nebuchadnezzar. There are many warning passages in Scripture designed by God to be a benefit to us in a life of faith. Oftentimes they are used as God's means to keep us from exalting ourselves and walking down a pathway of apostasy. How kind of God to give to Nebuchadnezzar again and again and again his messages. Warning, encouragement, exhortation, appeal. We won't find the same in chapter 5. Not everybody gets the same. Belshazzar, writing on the wall, dead the same night. Let's close in prayer. Oh God, you have said, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but whose delight is in your law who meditates in your law day and night, that one will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, not withering at the leaf, prospering in all he does. We pray to be so. You have also said the wicked are not like that. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. They will not stand in judgment. They will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. You know the way of the righteous, O Lord and the way of the wicked will perish. We pray, O God, to be like trees firmly planted, nourished by your word, your truth, your wisdom, your way. 
We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name.